Today's Talking Rivers podcast features John Eccles sharing some of his memories about working as a pilot boat skipper on the Ribble between 1959 and when the commercial docks closed in 1981. John refers to Andrew Newsham who joined him on the pilot boats and who continues to work for Preston City Council looking after the docks and marina, as well as others he worked with over the years. He also refers to some of the boats he skippered, such as the Joan and the Valiant. Further information can be found on the Ribble Life Together website and in our Preston Dock Circular Walk Guide. John had so many interesting stories, we hope you enjoy the selection we have put together for this podcast. And the idea in those days was that you, you if you went on the cutter uh, and they trained, you know, you trained and all the rest of it, different things, and you'd spend a year or 18 months, and then two of the pilots, there was Clark and Chambers, and they, they would get you away onto either the P&O lines or Blue Funnel, and you'd go as deck boy or something like that, and that was your stepping stone to going deep sea, and a lot did it. So that was my idea. I had 12 months, and uh, to be honest, I enjoyed it that much. I wanted to stop, so I stopped. Eventually, I used to go to night school at Fleetwood College there to help with different things. And um, anyway, one of the uh, skippers left under a bit of a cloud and just went. And uh, one at pilot says, do you fancy doing it? And I says, yeah, I don't mind. I was, I was about 18 and a half, I think, then. I was too young, by far. And... Uh, Anyway, they said, well, you're all right. There'll be a pilot with you each time you're going out, which, of course, there would be because they were coming on the boat and boarding. But they didn't tell me what was happening after they'd go, got off, you know. So anyway, so I had a lad. First lad was John Whiteside. Good lad. He was the one that ended up at p and And then eventually, and what used to annoy me was the skipper on the other watch, he was on full money. But because I was up my age, I was on a lot le- a lot less, and they wouldn't give me full money until I was twenty one. But anyway, that was it. Was a good learning curve. What can I tell you about Telly McKenna? Well, he originally he was uh, in Singapore during the Second World War, when the Japanese came in at the back of him and he got took prisoner in the, in the very early stages. And from what I can gather with him telling me, uh, he spent a lot of time, some of the time was in coal mines that they had and on coal ships they took them round. But what, whichever way it was, he was with them for six years, was Mike. And they didn't treat him too well, as you know. Now, funnily enough, Mac used to say there were some of them who were okay and some that, that weren't. But anyway, he was a tough little nut, was Mac, and he survived. When they came back from that situation, they were given most of the, I think it's right to say, they were given, I think it was a green card or something like that. And the different corporations and factories and what have you, once they had that green card, they were so because they'd been through what they'd been through, they were guaranteed a job. And Mac got a job with the corporation. And uh, they would find him something to do. Initially, he went on the survey boat. And uh, it was when they used to survey with a theodolite and, the, and a pole. And then, of course, they got a echo sounder later on. The Dex thing they did, they put the they give him a job on the barge. And uh, I know there was Teddy Woods, Teddy McKenna, and uh, Wilsden. I can't think of his first name. He had a light shop in Lytham. But he went on the barge, did Mac. Now, when they got the, they had a flat iron before they had the Musgrave. When they did get the Musgrave, it was plusher in a way, because it had a proper cabin, which was the old tugs, the master's cabin under the what would have been the, the wheelhouse. 
and uh, it was higher up as well because this flat iron used to get swept a bit when it was blowing hard. And um, they, they also used it as a base for the wall gang and the lights, the lads that did the lights. And at the after end, it was all teak and mahogany. It was beautiful inside. Anyway, they had portals at the back and the wall gang had been aboard, I think, doing a job or whatever. And unfortunately, they'd left the portal now whether Mac should have gone round and checked everything after they'd been. But anyway, the wind picked up and it got quite rough. And this portal that was left open kept slopping in water and eventually it went, sunk. But the back end went first. And Mac, I mean, there's all sorts of tales, but they used to, the, the lads reckoned that uh, instead of dialing 999, which I think he did, to say, get the lifeboat out here, this barge is sinking. Because Mac used to give tidbits and things to Gazette, it, they reckoned that he actually rang the Gazette first <laughs> and then rang 999. But anyway, they went, I think there was a sergeant at Lytham, what was it, Sergeant Brown, was it? Anyway, he sent a constable out on a push bike in them days in a bloody westerly gale on Blitham Beach going along prom and said, see if you can see the barge, because it had a, a red light on it, a fixed red light. Anyway, because he could see the red light, it had sunk, but because the mass was that tall, it was above the water. And he come back and he said, no, it's, I can see the red light. He said, well, you better launch lifeboat anyway. I think something like that. Anyway, the lifeboat launched, little Joe went alongside it, and they got Mac up, and he, he'd scrambled up this mast because it had rattlings, which are the la rattlings are, are ladders rigging up the, you see them on old ships, which they can go up the mast in his pyjamas. It was November, blowing a gale, and he, he was hanging on for dear life. And when they got finally got to him, he wasn't in a good state, you know, hypothermia. Anyway, they, apparently they pumped him with uh, brandy or rum or something. And John Kennedy used to tell us at the lifeboat, one of his tales was at the lifeboat supper that they brought Teddy Mark off paralytically drunk on a stretcher into the hospital. There is some pictures of him in paper, I think, but they've gone and photographed him. But yeah, he survived that anyway. I remember one night, it was with the Joan as well, with... Um, uh, it was a lovely night, flat calm, sun setting, beautiful sunset, right? And I could see this vessel coming in at a rate of knots. And uh, I had an old, uh, old Dick Evans. He was, he, he used to be a skipper of a minesweeper during war. And Dick was, was my mate, if you will, uh, on the cutter. There's only two of us on there. And he'd got, just gone ashore for, picked two pilots up and Teddy, who'd gone, gone home for a whatever, come back. Now, the Druid at that time hadn't got decent water. The tanks were rusty. So he used to get, take a, a, not a, a gallon container and bring fresh water back with him. Anyway... Dick's going across, and I see this boat coming down, and I thought, oh, it looked like the John, the Thomas Richardson, which was the fishery protection boat, and she was like an ML, a motor launch, fast motor launch, did about 15 knots. And uh, I thought, yeah, it's Thomas Richardson. Anyway, I go down to start the engines up, and as I come up out of the engine room into the after end, uh, pilots are coming across the arch and uh, Ted's gone on to barge. And I'll just look across and there's this customs vessel with a bow for gun on the foredeck. And this one's called the Valiant from Hollyhead. I mean, we knew it. Anyway, he's rounding up and it's just going dark, you know, about nine o'clock at night. So I thought, Christ, I can't have him coming alongside here because we'd had some hooch, see, down there. Anyway, I go, I go up into the wheelhouse and I 
lean out at wheelhouse door and I shout, you can't come alongside here, we're just going, you know. And over this tannoy, I mean, have you ever noticed on at night on, when it's st- still like that, your voice carries, well, he came over this tannoy, you will stay where you are. And I bet the whole of Lytham heard that. You will not move. And I thought, bloody hell. Anyway, he come alongside us and a two-ringer jumped aft, right? One knocked me out at way and went through into wheelhouse. Another one, because it was summer, we had uh, we had an escape patch up for it, and I used to open it to let air through. And another one went down for it. Three of them, and both hadn't actually got alongside. They just leaked on. Anyway, they shot down, and one of the pilots had said it. I, he saw it coming alongside. This is all happening in space of seconds, you know. And uh, he says, have you got any? I said, ah, there's a couple of bottles of gin in a box aft. He says, Christ. So he shot down into the cabin and come up. And just as he's chucking them over at the back end, this customs officer come round the corner. He says, what did you drop there? He says, nothing. He says, I heard something splash, he says. Well, our, our exhaust used to come out each side at quarter, at each side at boat, at stern. And he says, no, it's, it's the exhaust that's splashing. Uh, I heard you, I saw something. He said, you didn't see anything. He said, it's the exhaust. Anyway, he says, they've dropped something over at side. So this cutter backs off. Bloody great searchlights. And now these bottles of gin, they were, they were uh, blank and arm. And they'd little short necks like that. Well, if you can imagine, he's trying to find these things bobbing about in tide. There was only two of them. But the trouble was there was an empty box that had had 12 in. Anyway, uh, so he, he goes off and tries to if he couldn't find them. Comes back alongside and uh, one of the pilots says, uh, how long are you going to keep us? He says, we've got ships outside. He says, you might be going nowhere. <laughs> you know? The power, you know, customs. Anyway, one of Dick and myself are in wheelhouse and he he comes up and he says, who's Skipper? I says, I am. He says, where's your crew? I says, they're here. He says, how do you mean? We were bigger than them, you know. And uh, he says, where's your engineers and your deckhands? I says, there's only us two. He says, we've got whatever... 12 or whatever on, the, on that boat there. He said, you've surely got more crosses. No, there's only us two of you. He says, oh, well, you better come down with me. He says, we've found some stuff. So I go down and he's got Dick's bags tipped upside down on his bunk and mine's tipped upside down on mine. And on Dick's, I'd got nothing, fortunately. Dick had got some of this roll tobacco and a part of a bottle left of gin. So he says, how do you explain this? So Dick says, well, he was a scouser, by the way, this Dick. He come from Eswell, he was a shrimper. And uh, he says, well, we were outside doing a bit of waiting for a ship. He said, and we've been catching some mackerel. He said, and this ship passed us, and this, they come alongside and said, uh, are you catching anything? We said, yeah, if you want some. So we give them some uh, mackerel, and they give us this tobacco and and this boat was, he was shaking his head. He thought well, it was a good story, you know, but he wasn't worried it. Anyway, that was, they'd finished with us, but they went on to barge. Now, as Andrew says, because Mac had been in prisoner of war camp, he used to hide everything. He'd put telephone under the mattress, and it, it was just the thing with him. But they found this bottle of this gallon container of water, and of course they thought it were gin. And uh, anyway, they ended up pouring part of it out. And, Ma- and Max says, that's my blooming fresh water you're pouring away. And uh, anyway, they, they, but they ended up having to call Teddy's boss of that sector of the corporation, like the dredging and the barge, was under a chap called Captain Everett, who was a dredging superintendent. And they actually rang him up at home to see that Mac, what he'd got on barge and everything was theirs, you know. Anyway, nothing ever happened of it. When uh, I joined the uh, St Anne, we joined it going down Lytham Pier. I remember it, uh, I think it was on a Sunday. Anyway, we 
went down, then went to the barge, which was the Musgrave in those days. And we worked from the barge as a base. The pilots used to come down the beach at four hours to high water, which then took us an hour to get out to Gut Boy. And then the, we would board the ships with the pilots. We would stay out at Gut Boy waiting for the ships coming out from Preston Dock. In those days, there was 12 pilots, as I remember, and the shipping was only just getting on to the where there were containers coming in. But most of the, there were no designated container ships in those days. There was the ferries with the roll on, roll off. Most of the ships that took uh, what they call flats, which were part of a, a wagon which they lifted off the quay onto the ship, uh, they were just like normal coasters with the derricks removed. A lot of them had wooden hatches and tarpaulins over the top. But we used to do a week on, week off on the cutters, and we, we stayed out in the river, tied up to the barge in, in between the tides with the boat. When the, our week was up, which was usually a Tuesday relief day, we went to dock and the St Margaret come out. While the cutters were in the dock, they would be uh, painted and victualled and that sort of thing. Uh, when the containers started to pick up, we were then getting container ships that were specifically built to carry containers, uh, such as with McGregor hatches and the like, which were steel hatches, a lot safer plus the fact that the trade was beginning to pick up and we went from 12 to 15 and then eventually we had 22 pilots in total. I think that was uh, in about 1964. In 1960, they knocked the pier down at Lytham, of which the pilots used to use to come alongside and uh, go ashore in. When we picked the pilots up at the barge, at the barge hole, uh, it was with a sculling punt. And uh, in bad weather, what used to happen, you'd scull across from the barge, the pilots would get in the boat, and with just not with just one oar, which I was doing as lad, the pilots would pick the oars up and pull out to the barge. If it was really bad, the pilot cutter would go off down tide towards Lytham and he'd, we'd just drift down to him and they'd pick us up there. The other way of doing it was if it was blowing really hard, which happened, when there was a gale on, uh, the skipper had tow us up past the V-wall lamp and let me go, and I'd just go into the beach and work out to where the pilots would be picked up off the beach and so on. It was a lot better with the Valiant. I don't think, well, in fact, I know when we got the Valiant, we never had any pilot carry away. Now, what I mean by that is that when we had the Joan, and the Anne, you, uh, if a ship was coming down and he wanted, you wanted to get outside to pick him off, if it was really blowing hard, it wasn't so much that we couldn't get outside, we could, but we couldn't get alongside the ships because of the state of the weather. And consequently, the pilot would carry away, bearing in mind that we might only be going out to pick that one pilot off and you'd got another 12 ships behind you with pilots on that wanted to get off. And of course, we couldn't pick them all off at Little Ones. You know, if it was a big rush in a summer, you probably could. But you couldn't get all the others off. So for the sake of the one going away, we'd pick the 12 off behind, you know. And I think the furthest anybody carried away was a pilot called Kerr, Scotchman. And he carried away to Dunkirk, which seems a long way. But it was blowing that hard that winter None of the, he would, he'd go to, when he left us, he'd go to the bar. Well, the, if we couldn't get him off, you could wreck the bar was up at the pier head, which it was that day. He'd then go to Hollyhead and, be, and they shelter in the Isle of Man. Well, this ship wasn't going to go to the Isle of Man, so he, he couldn't get off at Hollyhead. So he went down the coast, and of course the next one was in the channel. And it would have meant going into some of these others. And this ship was, I think he was tight on time or something. But uh, And Kerr, because he, 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 he actually lived in Scotland on an island or something, and he used to go up when he had his time off. But he, he, he lodged in a house in Lytham, so he wasn't bothered. 
So he, he just carried away. But most of them would either go to the Isle of Man and, or to Hollyhead and they'd get picked off and they'd either fly back or come back on the train. But the Valiant, we never had a pilot carry away because what you what we could do with her because of her speed, we could pick them off inside and lead them out until they were happy and then we'd just he'd, we'd come back and the ship would go on, you know. It was a much better and safer arrangement, really, because they weren't getting off in, in really bad weather. I think it was November, it was winter anyway, cold, foggy night. And, um, well, visibility, it wasn't dense fog, but it was, it was visibility wasn't good, but it was flat calm. And they'd come down. He'd, bought, he'd gone alongside this coaster, a Dutch chap, I think it was. Well, it would be Dutch coaster. And Harris came down the ladder. And you'd have to know the pilot because he, he he'd be thinking salmon fishing because that's what he liked doing. And he'd come down and they used to wear these sea-safe coats, which was like a normal weatherproof coat, but it had a life jacket inbuilt in it. And that was fine, providing you had it shut. And, and your belt was pulled in as well because they had an automatic blow up, you know. Anyway, he, it was open. And he he come down the ladder. They were out at wall end there. He come down the ladder and let go of the thing onto the... And because the Joan had no ladder rails around the outside of it, the rails were on the inside. You know, you couldn't go alongside a ship with rails, otherwise you'd bend them. So it was open. Anyway, Harris didn't get hold of the rail and the Joan had a very bad habit of flopping to one side like a destroyer used to when you pulled off. As he pulled off, he lost his balance, went over the side. We think he hit his head on the side of the, the ship, which can cost him slightly. We think that's what happened. Harris is in the, in the drink now. Mick comes back round to him. And behind him, he's got the Ionic Ferry and the Terrier, which was a container. Well, she was a coaster, really, that carried containers and, and just general cargo. And Mick had told them on the radio that Harris had gone in the drink. So he, he manoeuvres the cutter back alongside him. He was fortunate to see him. It's dark. It's about one o'clock in the morning. Anyway, he, uh, he got alongside him. And the Joan had, she had a six foot freeboard at the minimum. So Mick goes, he gets all, he hangs onto the one of the bollards and he goes down onto the next belting down, which was a, it was about a foot wide, this belting with a rubber, a rubber all the way around. Mick's hanging onto the, this bollard up here and he grabs all of Harris by his collar and he's, he's supporting him. And it's near where this exhaust puff, puff, puff in, in his face. Harris, so Mick moves him a bit and he must have been going because he grabs at Mick and pulls Mick into water with him. So two of them are in water now and Mick can't swim. And fortunately, he floats the right way up, facing the cutter. So he, he puts his arm on the belt in because it was a big round rubber. So you could get your arm wedged, it, if you will, at the back of it. And he, he hung on to Harris. The lad at that time, he really couldn't do much. Now, while all this is going on, the terrier has manoeuvred alongside the cutter with Pilot Marshall on it, and the ferry has manoeuvred alongside the terrier with another pilot on it. And the ferry's put all the, the searchlights on the area that he had, plus the terrier. The mate... And the bosun come off and Marshall come off the Marshall being the pilot come off the terrier and they come and they, they see what the situation is. So the bosun goes and gets the pilot ladder and throws it over the side. In the meantime, pilot Marshall jumps in the water as well to give Mick a lift. But there's three of them now. None of them can get out because it's too high. The bosun puts the ladder down. And the mate comes and they gets down. And I think by that time, Pilot Cowie had come off the ferry and he'd got onto the cutter. And so they're all round this back end and they get Harris off first and then Marshall, because he was older, 
<laughs> and then poor old Mick, <laughs> he's got nothing in no life jacket, can't swim, and they drag him up in the end, at the back end, if you will. So at the, the last one to come up, they take Harris down into the engine room and Cowie starts pumping him, but he didn't get in much water out of him. Anyway, they're on the way now and Cutter's on its way back to Lytham. They launch Lifeboat, or they launch the IRB actually, with uh, to go to the barge. But the doctor, they were going to pick up off the beach because what happened was they rang me at home told me what was happening. Well, the cutter marshal had a link call to me to come down to Lytham and somehow get onto the to barge to help them. And uh, when I got to the top of the beach, Dr. Glynn, I think, it, no, it wasn't Glynn, it was Dr. Reed, I think, who was a lifeboat doctor then. He, he, I met him at the top of the beach and uh, I said, have they got are they getting you out? And they said, yeah, I'm to get aboard the cutter. I said, yeah, they've got me out as well. Anyway, by that time, I could see the cutter coming back. And she'd do about 12 knots when she was flat out. And anyway, they got back to the barge. Uh, in the meantime, we'd got a punt and gone to the barge and the ILB came down. And we carried Harris up the beach to the ambulance. But there was he was dead when they got to... Uh, Victoria Hospital. But I think he died of hypothermia more than anything. Because Cowie said he didn't get any water out of him, you know. Yeah. So I do. Yeah. Yeah, Mick got a... I think it's the Liverpool Humane Society or something like that. Our Talking Rivers series of audio productions has been brought to you by Ribble Rivers Trust as part of the Ribble Life Together project. It celebrates the rich cultural, social and natural heritage of the Ribble catchment. Creating the series has been made possible by National Lottery Players through the Heritage Fund. For more episodes and information, visit ribblelifetogether.org. <laughs>